They'll be preaching from 1 Peter 4, verses 7 through 11. I'll read from the beginning of the chapter. There's a continuation of things that are going on here. So, 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. As good good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. That in all things God might may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The end of all things is at hand. With these words, Peter calls you to action, to live as one who is born again to a living hope, as he describes it in chapter 1. He calls you to live out your faith, and he does so with an urgency that the time is short, the end is at hand. And Peter isn't the only one who has this sense of the shortness of our time here on earth. Listen to what the Apostle John says in 1 John 2. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen, by which we know that it is the last hour. And Paul in Romans 13. It is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of the darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I hope you catch that sense of urgency that Peter and the other New Testament writers have. An urgency that's born out of the persecution that the church faced in Peter's day and continues to face until Christ comes again. And there's a sense of urgency of that shortness of time, that there is a living life expecting the coming day of the Lord, a day in which there will be vindication for those believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, but a day of judgment and of separation of those who do not believe in Jesus Christ. So like the verses 1 through 6 earlier in this chapter where Peter calls to action, he does so again. The slight difference, the first verses of this chapter have the idea of putting off what is sinful. And these verses have the idea of putting on what is obedience, what is righteous, what it means to be a born-again Christian. So in this passage, I, I, I call to you as fellow believers to stand fast in this evil age. And as you have put off former sins, Peter arms you with this call to action. 
And he arms you with three commands. Commands that come out of this new birth in Jesus Christ. A rebirth that really does indeed reverse your life. And that reverse is going to be shown as Peter calls to mind these positives and sets them in comparison to the negatives that he had in these first verses. To keep it simple, I'm going to boil it down to those three commands. I'm going to boil it down to three simple words, three single words that are about the living out of the born-again Christian life. I'll even give them to you now. So if you want to fill it in in your, in your bulletin, these are the three commands he gives. Pray, love, and serve. Now let me explain each one of those. Peter's first admonition is about prayer. He says, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now, some translations are a little more literal in how they put that. Some of them say, be serious and sober in your prayers. And you can see by that translation how this is going to stand in contrast to what he has described before. What you put off is drunkenness, is being immoderate in your lifestyle. And here, Peter says, be sober. Be serious in your prayers. What you see is that as a Christian, he leads you out of that former life that was characterized by an emptiness, a, an indulgence in a variety of things that serve to dull your mind and to dull your conscience about where you are standing in front of a God who is holy, holy, holy. So rather than be living a life that is submerged in drunkenness and unrestrained partying, Peter calls you to put off those old ways and instead brings a new life that is, is full of life, a life that takes deep pleasure in being in your right mind rather than being out of your mind and using sound judgment and moderation. That word is, that is used basically does refer to moderation in drink, but it has in mind self-control in, in all of the areas of life. You could apply it or think of it in that way. But Peter has a reason for using these words. He connects this discipline to your prayers and to the profound urgency of prayer in the Christian life. Remember, he started this passage by saying, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, pray. Be serious be sober-minded in your prayers. It's as if Peter is saying, wake up, Christian. Now is not the time to dull your mind in a drunken stupor. Your suffering, your going through persecution or a variety of troubles in this life may tempt you in the direction of losing the pain or dulling your mind so that you do not have a sense of the, uh, of the agony in which you're going through. And there really is an agony that you go through. And Peter doesn't uh, mince any words in the rest of, of the scripture about the affliction that you go through. He doesn't say it's not real doesn't say that, uh, that, uh, that you should be happy at all times. He says, you are indeed suffering. But the answer is not to try to lose yourself or to cover that over by distracting yourself in any way. By trying to distract yourself will never solve the problem. It only pushes it aside. Now is the time to be awake. Now is the time to be alert. And the answer 
of the Christian life to the urgency of your persecution, the urgency of your suffering, the answer is to be prayerful about those things. It is a, it is a discipline of your mind. It is a, a, a structuring of your time so that you can commune with the Lord in prayer. The born-again Christian prays, especially in the midst of the urgency of affliction. I found it helpful to think of prayer as John Piper sometimes describes it. He says that in, in, in the modern evangelical mindset that we've come to think of prayer in this way. Imagine that you're... Uh, on a Saturday afternoon, reclining in your easy chair. You got the remote in one hand, a cool drink in the other, and something is playing on the TV. And so you find that you need some more chips, and so you pull out your phone and you text your spouse and says, hey, could you, uh, you send some goodies into the den so that uh, I don't have to get up and uh, exert myself? We can think of prayer in that way, of asking God to, uh, to make things easy for us. In our easy life, we would be blessed. Don't get me wrong, it's good to play, pray for blessing, but to pray for deliverance and direction. But as John Piper says, that's not the essence of prayer. Rather than thinking of it as calling and asking for goodies in the den, think of prayer this way. You are a soldier in a foxhole in the midst of a raging battle. And you use your walkie-talkie to call out desperately for help, to send support, to send other forces to come and to rescue you to battle against the enemy. Earlier we sang Psalm 55, and we did so for this reason. Did, I hope you caught the urgency that David spoke of in that psalm. He, he was literally fleeing for his life from his own son who had betrayed him and his most trusted friend and counselor who had deceived him. He cries out in the midst of that trouble. He prays to God for deliverance. It's that sense of urgency in prayer that Peter has when he says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, pray. Be alert, be serious, be sober about this. Don't treat it as an option, but as something that is vital to your life, vital to the born-again Christian life. Well, this takes practice. It takes diligence and devotion to do. It is, it is a skill that you can grow in. I would urge you with the urgency that Peter has about prayer to, to think about your own prayer life and to think about what a reorientation that Peter brings, this urgency that he brings, how that can reshape your prayers, what you might need to do to devote attention and time to prayer. The Christian life is a life of prayer. By God's grace, he leads you to fight against all things that are mindless in our culture. Believe me, there are many things that are mindless, all things that are distracting, all things that dull you, be they substance or social media, be they work or play. Christ calls you and enables you to come to him who is able to save, to cry out to him in the midst of that distress. And with an urgency 
to let your requests be made known to God. And in fact, Christ gives you his spirit to renew your mind in this. And he gives you his spirit to draw you along in this. So that when you do not know what to say, the spirit gives utterance to those urgent prayers. It gives impetus to you to cry out to him in prayer. How shall we live then since the end of all things is at hand? Pray. Be serious and watchful. Be sober in your prayers. The second command that Peter gives is to love. His words here are, have fervent love for one another. Once more, Peter is contrasting something with what, <clears throat> with what went before, what to put off and what to put on. The previous life, the former life in which Jesus has saved us from, is a life that is full of lust and lewdness. Those are the words that he used. In riotous parties that uh, in, in Peter's day were, would often be involving temple prostitutes. Put those things off, and instead, the contrasting virtue, the contrasting command of Peter is to love one another. And it's not the love that is polluted by our sinful sexual desires, but it is the pure and holy love that God has for us and that we then share with one another. I'm drawn to Jesus' own teaching here. Remember, Peter often is interacting with Jesus' words that he heard. So Peter applies what he heard from Jesus. When Jesus answered the question, what is the greatest commandment? He affirmed the answer that the, uh, that the rich young ruler gave to him, that, he, that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. As you come to understand Christian love, I think that you will find that, that to love anyone besides yourself is the gift of God. To love yourself is where we naturally, sinfully go. In fact, you might say that's the fundamental idolatry of all mankind is to elevate ourselves above everyone and everything else. But the call of Christ and his enabling grace, in other words, your salvation enables you to love God and to love others. That's, uh, that's radical in this world. It is the gift of God and the power of his spirit and his love at work in you. Not only does Peter call attention to this great commandment and, and, uh, and its uh, corollary, the second commandment, he adds to that. Um, excuse me, I wanted to call attention to the fact that Peter uh, actually has called uh, has actually spoken of this before and for in chapter 1 verse 22 peter says that insincere love of the brethren love one another fervently with a pure heart and there's that word fervent again that he uses here in chapter 4 and fervent love might be better understood or translated as constant love uh, it's not fervent in the idea of passionate but fervent in the idea of there's a staying power to it. And it is indeed the word that, uh, that Peter uses. It is indeed that self-sacrificing love that God has shown you as a sinner. It is patient. 
is kind. It does not envy or parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, and so on, as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13. And in this case, now I'll call your attention to what Peter adds. He adds this moving description of Christian love as a love that will cover a multitude of sins. He quotes from the Old Testament book of Proverbs, chapter 10, verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. You know what he means by that? You know what it means that love covers sins? But it means that when your brother or sister, for the children, you can think of your literal brother or sister. For you adults, you can think of your Christian brothers or sisters. When when they sin against you, our natural tendency is to sin back or to become offended by that, and to remember it, and to rehearse it in our minds, and to become bitter over that sin. Now, there are some sins that need to be confronted, but a great number of sins may be covered over by love. They may be forgiven without storming in to your brother or sister and confronting them and berating them for their sin against you. Now, how in the world can you act this way? How can you forgive and forget these minor sins against you? Well, you can do so because... This is the way God has forgiven you. This is the way God has loved you. He has loved you enough to send his own son to die on the cross to cover all of your sins. And in this case, when God covers your sins, when Christ's blood covers your sins, there is a complete doing away with our sins. It is, it is a, the judgment is satisfied by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven indeed. When you choose then to forgive someone of their sins, by love you are saying, I will not remember this sin. I will not count it against you. I will not become bitter over this and make this an offense that breaks our fellowship. As I said, there are certainly some sins that must be confronted, but not every sin rises to that level. There are a great number of offenses that you may cover over in love. We can do this because we love him because he first loved us. And that love of God stretches us, doesn't it? When you meditate on how God has loved you, it it presses upon you to be loving as you have been uh, as you have been loved. It is so important that the apostle John says that if you love God, you will also love your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the vertical love of God that we enjoy that is to be displayed in, in the horizontal, in our relationship to one another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, husbands and wives, members of your own family. And it's so important that not only does John say that this must be done, he says, if you do not show love 
to your brothers and sisters who you can see, how will you show love to God who you cannot see? It's a very convicting conclusion that he brings. That the born-again Christian loves fervently, constantly, his brothers and sisters in Christ. That the born-again Christian practices this type of pure and godly love. And like with prayer, this is something that doesn't come easy, but it can be learned. It can be practiced. And it begins by meditating on just how God has loved you. So let me remind you and, and urge you to go back and read the first chapter of 1 Peter, if you have any doubts. Go back and read 1 Peter and meditate on what Christ has done for you. And then pray that the Lord would give you such love for him that you would also show it to those around you in faith. How shall we then live since the end of all things is at hand? Love. Love one another fervently, for love covers a multitude of sins. I might even say it, love one another by covering a multitude of sins. Third, serve. Use your gifts to benefit others. This comes from verses 9 through 11. It another contrast from a previous way of life. The previous way of life was marked by exploiting others, of using your advantage to, uh, to, to take advantage of those that are around you, to advance yourself. Here, Peter describes our, uh, our relationship with, to one another in the area of service. He calls us to minister to one another, minister this manifold grace of God that you have received in a faithful and, uh, and a way that points to our salvation in Jesus Christ. Peter doesn't list uh, the, a variety of gifts like some of the other New Testament passages does do. And f- instead, he, he speaks of two broad categories of gifts, gifts of service and gifts of speaking. He speaks generally about serving one another with that manifold grace of God, but then he gives one very particular way that you may serve one another. He says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Here's another contrast that's being set up. Uh, instead of a former life that is full of, of orgies, the, the, the description he gives there, instead of making your home a house of idolatrous sexual acts, make your home a haven for fellow pilgrims. A haven. And it's good to, to remind ourselves here of the context of which Peter wrote. Is what does hospitality mean? It doesn't mean what it commonly thought of today, the idea of inviting your friends over to share a meal. That's good. In fact, that's a, that's a good practice. Uh, it builds fellowship. But the biblical idea of hospitality gets at another basic need of their day. It has in mind giving shelter and food to those who are traveling And even more specifically, of giving food and shelter to those who may be put out of their homes because of persecution. There is service that is rendered to those who are in need. So as a good steward of that manifold grace of God, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. In other words... Make use of your resources knowing that that God has entrusted them to you. Do you catch that you are a steward? 
That means that, that, that the Lord God is the owner of all of these things. But he's entrusted them to you, to use in a stewardly fashion. And when you understand that, then there is an openness of hand. Rather than when you get it the wrong way around, you think all of these things are mine, and I can't bear to part with them, and my brother's in need, and I've got to help him, and you grumble about helping someone who's in need because you're so tied to your own material possessions. So God calls you as a steward, as a born-again Christian, to understand who you are, to make use of the resources that he has blessed you with, to bless others around you, and to give relief in their need. Now, I can assign you to think of what those resources might be. I'll give you a couple of examples, but I'll urge you to be thinking about these things. What resources do you have? Well, you have some that are physical God has blessed you with money. It's not yours. It's God's. Be a steward of that money in a way that gives you a freedom to bless others and to help those in need. It may be in the form of opening your home to someone whose house has been destroyed by a fire or tornado. It may have the idea of buying some extra diapers to donate to those who are, are, are having trouble having diapers for their children. It may be recognizing that putting food on the table for some right here in our own community is a pressing need. So it may be that you gather cans of food and staples to fill up our cauldron to donate to our daily bread. There are other resources that you have as well, resources like your time. It may be that you carry on a ministry of availability to those who have a pressing need to go to be with someone who is grieving, to visit someone who is sick. It may be that you have an ability to babysit or to mow a lawn, give of your time, your other resources. You give a listening ear, a praying heart and mouth to those who are in need. Serve one another, care for one another without grumbling. In doing so, you bring glory to God. There's a second aspect of service, the service of words. Now, there are several applications of gifts of words that the, uh, the rest of Scripture calls to mind, uh, the ideas of encouraging and teaching training. But here, God has especially in mind the work of the elders of the church, of the preaching and teaching of God's word. Once more, I want you to understand that the elders of the church are stewards of the manifold grace of God. I stand before you today not in my own strength, not in my own wisdom, not in my own authority, but as a steward of God who has given his word to be read and preached. And he's raised up ruling elders in our congregation and in, the, and in the church worldwide. And we are praying that the Lord would continue to do that. Why? Because as part of the ministry of God, there is a ministry of the word of God. And he calls attention here to the oracles of God, which means simply the and profoundly, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the act of preaching is to stand as a herald of Christ and to tell you that there is forgiveness of sins. 
And there is an urgency to this message, isn't there? The end of all things is at hand. And I have a responsibility to warn you of that coming day of judgment. And I have the joyful responsibility of encouraging you, those of you who are believers in Christ, to stand fast in that faith. And that you can do so because of Jesus, because what he has done for you. And in saying this, I don't diminish the important role that every member has to read the word of God, to respond to it yourselves. But Peter calls attention to this particular means of service, this particular means of grace, and the importance of the sermon and what it has in your life. There is an urgency and a glory to what he says. The urgency comes from, from, that, uh, from those opening words. The end of all times is at hand. You need to know that one day you will stand before the judge of all. Lord Jesus Christ. Peter already called attention to that in the verses just previous to this. God will judge the living and the dead. Be sober and vigilant then in the Christian life, living out the newness of life you have. But there is glory as well in this, and it's on this note that I'll close. Listen again to verse 11. That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is attached especially to the idea of serving one another, but it, uh, it could well and does well address all of this paragraph. That in all that we do, in our prayers, in our love, and in our service, that we do all to the glory of God. And that he does indeed get glory as you live out the Christian life. So I'll say again, how shall we then live? The end of all things is at hand. Live as those born again to a living hope. Pray, love, and serve. God alone be the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we are so grateful that you have caused us to be born again. You have freed us from that former way of life and its bondage. You have made us alive. Lord, out of joy and out of gratitude, may we live that Christian life. May we live it in a way that, that understands that our time here is short and that there is an urgency about the Christian life. There is a glory about the Christian life. May we live it wholeheartedly in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. We've sung about praying, we've sung about loving one another, we'll close by singing about serving one another. Psalm 37, Selection C. There are a variety of aspects of this that you'll see, and uh, we'll sing this as a profession of faith and our, our purpose to serve God. Psalm 37C, please stand to sing.